Just one quick comment uh, about alternative investments. Um, and uh, Phil had mentioned that I am involved with a company called Adriatic Capital Partners. I got involved a number of years ago uh, in this area when I really came to realize that there was something exceptional about specifically private equity. And uh, I am even more convinced of that. Um, in fact, I'll even go so far as to say that I believe that private equity is structurally a superior form of investing to investing in publicly traded companies. Now, not everybody can put all of their money in private equity, but um, the argument for that I think is reasonably strong. Uh, and if you are interested in hearing more about that, uh, one of uh, Joe's uh, associates, uh, founder of iCapital Network, did a Bloomberg radio segment with me uh, several months back. And uh, you can check that out. Um, you can Google search it or send me an email, and I'll send you the link, and you can listen to that as to why uh, private equity um, is exceptional. And if you're not in private equity, you should be. And if you think private equity is LBOs, you're wrong. Uh, there are a lot of uh, superior advantages to it, and all you have to do is ask Warren Buffett, because Berkshire Hathaway is largely a private equity firm. And uh, control and things like that are an essential element of, uh, of, pri of many uh, private equity type ventures, not all. Okay, so uh, with that commercial out of the way, uh, the thing I would like to do is ask each of our panelists to give a brief introduction of themselves, their firm, and why don't we go Outside in, Ali. Hi, Ali Motamid. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Invenomic Capital Management. I was at uh, Boston Partners Rubico for 14 years, um, where we manage the same strategy. It's a long, short U.S. equity strategy uh, that's in a 40 act format. Uh, my 40 act fund is ticker BIVIX, B I V I X, um, variable long short, and I uh, look forward to talking to you guys today. Okay. Chris? Thanks, Vinny. My name is Chris Bataferano. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Finemark National Bank and Trust. Uh, we are a um, Florida-based bank out of Fort Myers. As Phil mentioned, I office in Palm Beach. Uh, we're managing about $2.8 billion today on the uh, investment side and in terms of uh, on the bank side, about a billion five in, in deposits. Um, we have offices here in Florida, South Carolina, and in Arizona. I'm Jeff Brown, uh, founder and chief investment officer for a private equity real estate firm out of Chicago called T2 Capital Management. Uh, we currently manage roughly a quarter billion dollars. Our niche is in the smaller uh, Midwest space in real estate, a hyper-fragmented, inefficient space. So we play in the same large pool as the Blackstones and KKRs of the world, but basically on the other end of the spectrum to try to take uh, advantage of some inefficiencies that are out there. Okay, and Joe? Joe Burns, uh, Managing Director at iCapital Network. Uh, iCapital as a company was founded about five years ago to provide private fund access, both private equity, as Vinny alluded to, private credit and hedge funds to high net worth investors and their advisors. Uh, we're approaching $5 billion in capital offered through a series of funds across the alternatives landscape. Okay, terrific. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, turn to you first, Chris, and uh, if you could give us a, a sense of the alternative investment space from a, uh, from a structural point of view. I think uh, many think that it's a, a one-off and it's this area only. And I mentioned before, uh, many think that uh, 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 private equity, for example, uh, uh, is all about LBOs and leverage deals and stuff like that. Can you kind of educate everyone, uh, if they aren't aware, of the, of the alternative investment space, the kind of the case for it? Sure. Um, yeah, a couple of things to that question. I mean, structurally, um, I think, you know, the variety of, of alternatives that you're alluding to, Vinny, tend to be uh, much more illiquid and much more long-lived, right? Uh, and, and things that aren't screen-priced, things that aren't transparent. And um, perhaps that's what many think of when they think of alternatives, but alternatives also include plenty of investment options that are uh, extremely transparent and extremely liquid. And, you know, for example, uh, I know Ali will talk about it, um, but some that are uh, compatible to even a 40-act structure, right? Things that 
uh, everyone can really understand and, and are quite simply to, uh, to price, right? So from our perspective at Finemark today, um, the lion's share of what we're doing is on the liquid side. Uh, we sort of break the liquid hedge fund world into three large buckets, uh, long, short, multi-strategy, and then managed futures and macro we put sort of together in one bucket. In terms of how they uh, work in a portfolio, truly the purpose of them is to operate as uh, non-correlated or much lesser correlated uh, components of the portfolio. And so when we think about the large asset classes that we allocate to, equities, fixed income, and alternatives, they're by far the smallest, but they have probably the largest impact given their correlations are so much lower to traditional market betas. Um, and so that's you know really how we integrate them for clients uh, in, a, in a liquid format today. Um, but do agree with what Vinny mentioned, that the idea of investing in that illiquid um, spectrum makes a lot of sense, particularly for uh, clients and families that are able to trade liquidity for returns, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we're not doing it at fine market today, but that, that's a very sensible approach as well. All right, terrific. And, and since you've mentioned liquidity, can you talk a little bit about liquid alts, liquid alternatives? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that, about it being a, uh, an attractive area to be invested in, that there are um, potentially ETFs being created that are intended to mimic uh, investments in alternative investment areas. Thoughts with that? Chris? Oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't know if yeah. you were talking, Ali. Yeah, I mean, so clearly there are certain alternative strategies that uh, fit a liquid vehicle, you know, whether it's a mutual fund or even if it's an LP and they're offering, you know, quite favorable liquidity terms. I think as an investor, uh, when you're doing your diligence on a on a on a hedge fund strategy, you really have to understand the uh, underlying collateral, the philosophy, and the approach of the manager, um, so that you really can get down to sort of what goes into building that portfolio. Right? Is it is it cash equities? Is it is it bonds? Are they futures? Um, there are certain types of hedge fund strategies that simply don't fit that that bill, right? If you're talking about more exotic credit strategies, if you're talking about privates, if you're talking about venture, if you're talking about real estate investments, a lot of times they simply uh, just don't fit that that uh, structure. You don't want to you don't want to invest in something where you think you're getting better liquidity than than the underlying truly exhibits because that mismatch, while you might view it favorably going into it, can be very detrimental if you're not the person that's using that liquidity during a time of stress, right? If you're not one of the first or the first person out of the strategy before uh, an expansion of volatility event occurs and, and that liquidity window becomes more narrow. So I think it's really important to those that are allocating capital to understand the liquidity characteristics of the underlying um, components of the strategy and what those liquidity uh, uh, characteristics are in good times and bad, right? Are they something that can be, uh, you know, ephemeral in nature? Can they can they go away in a, in a strained environment? Um, Ali, that uh, Chris mentioned that you might be able to add something to the whole liquidity part of the discussion. So I'm going to just open it up for you to explore any area that you wish in regards to uh, liquidity and alternative investments. Sure. I, I think that, you know, liquid alternatives are used by people to complement, I think, largely nowadays ETF kind of driven portfolios where you can add a lot of alpha. Uh, and non-correlation, as Chris mentioned, on top and kind of be able to build products that suit client needs, uh, that have relatively low fees and that at, at, at the same time, you know, don't have market correlation for, for, for example, clients that are, you know, getting farther along and, and are, are more conservative and kind of mix and match. Uh, the good thing about liquid strategies is they can be accessed. I mean, they have SEC restrictions that, so if you're in a 40-act format, there is a lot that goes into making sure that the underlying strategy is capable of handling almost the full redemption of a fund in a, in a couple day period. So they do go through that for you. These are also strategies that are very accessible. I think you can go through Fidelity, Schwab, almost any kind of platform and buy them just as you would a mutual fund. Um, so generally, it's kind of as you look at mutual funds and how they evolved. I mean, Warren Buffett started as a partnership 
uh, and then you saw the evolution of that, and, and to a large extent you're seeing the same thing in hedge funds. Uh, the one thing I, I would again reiterate is that it doesn't work for all strategies. You can't just wrap a hedge fund in a 40 act structure. It's a very dangerous thing to do because if you don't have that mismatch, it's going get, to get ugly. But you know, the beauty of the 40 Act business and the SEC regulations is they do go through a whole lot uh, you know, that we've been through to make sure that they understand and that, that the strategies do kind of meet those liquidity needs. Now, you said just a moment ago, relatively low fees. Okay, one of the things in, that has been a, a, an area of discussion in alternative investment investments in general are fees, two and 20, things of that sort. What's your take on relatively low fees and uh, the state of fees and fee structure within alternative investments? Yeah, I mean, two and 20 is very rare these days. I mean, there's a few, but you don't see that. But fixed fees are more commonplace in the liquid, uh, liquid alternatives. Generally, you'll find the fees peak out sort of around the 2% range, uh, depending on you know, the manager and the strategy. I think one thing to keep in mind in a lot of cases is it's 2% on the, on, a, on the assets, but there's gross investment that's beyond what you would traditionally find, and that's how you can add the value. Uh, you know, our fund, for example, is almost 200% gross invested, so while you do pay fees that are 2%, you're paying it on double the actual underlying. Uh, so it's a little bit different, and I think they do make a nice mix with ETFs and things like that that can help you balance, right? So you could take, for example, vehicles that have a 2% fee and mix them with 60, 70% of a S&P Vanguard uh, nine basis points and build out products for clients that are able to meet their needs, flex to what kind of each independent person wants, and the aggregates come down quite a bit. And you're, you're investing in products that are very much focused on alpha and non-correlation. I think one of the things that people find in many cases, especially with long-only type strategies, is while, while the fee may be lower, there's also a lot of uh, sort of managing to, to the benchmarks. And so if you're paying someone to manage to the benchmarks, you're not really paying for that incremental alpha. So, you know, they can be a good complement to, I think, the way people view uh, investment portfolios now. So I think they're, they are a complement for most people. And uh, I think with the way it's evolved, they can fit very well into most people in some level. I like that, managing to the benchmark. <laughs> that, that, that's good. It, it, it has a reminiscent uh, a tone to it of uh, you know, closet indexing. And in that's some basically a lot of, I mean, you hear a lot of that, right? I mean, there's a lot yeah. of risk. Their risk is that they don't meet their, the benchmark expectations. If they beat, beat by 10 basis points, then they beat the expectation and they outperform. Right. Uh, so there, there, that does happen on long onlys, but that's why I think a lot of people have recognized that and they moved to an ETF investment, right? They drop the fees by a lot and they're not that different. But at the same time, you can overlay, you know, uh, very non-correlated, you know, returns on top of that, and blending them out comes out a little bit different. Okay, you're going to add something? Yeah, I want to add one thing. You know, we talked a bit about the underlying nature of the securities and, and tying that into a liquid 40 act structure. The other thing to keep in mind in your question on fees, and Vinny made me think of it, certain strategies are just naturally capacity constrained, regardless of, of the liquidity. So, you know, specifically, if you're thinking about uh, quantitative strategies that involve a lot of short-term trading, those are naturally going to be capacity constrained. And so the managers that engage in those types of strategies and sort of the masters of the universe here would be guys like Renaissance or a Two Sigma or a D Shaw. They may, maybe the strategy could fit into a 40 act vehicle, but because there's so little capacity and they don't have the ability to charge a carry on that, there's no financial incentive for them to do that. And so you need to be cognizant of that when you're looking at the hedge fund universe that there is some, and no disrespect, there is some adverse selection in that not every type of strategy, regardless of the liquidity, will fit a liquid vehicle. And so you have to be aware of that. You may need to invest in an LP to get a, an entire smattering of, of hedge fund exposure. And these types of strategies are ones that, because there's such a little amount that can be run in them, the manager themselves will not put that in a 40 extra. There's no financial incentive for them to do it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Jeff, your, your area, like mine, except completely different from what I'm doing, but it, it, it is in some respects similar in that um, it's kind of in a targeted area. It's a niche 
uh, and you're looking for the inefficiencies within that niche. And so take us into a little bit of kind of the day-to-day -day operations of how you guys go about finding a deal, sourcing a deal, structuring a deal, raising the money, if it, unless you, you, know, you have the pool of money already there. Take us, you know, a day in the life of your firm, so to speak. Okay. Um, so at, at T2, just starting with a real macro level, we, we manage uh, two funds right now. We're on our sixth fund since our, our inception. We, we, were, um, uh, we were formed in 2010, raised our first fund with outside capital in 2011 and we've since raised five uh, funds thereafter. We have, uh, we deliberately cover the entire capital structure in the real estate world. By that I mean we have one fund that's a debt-oriented uh, fund, which is a yield play in today's market, and that, that's been a really uh, nice piece of our investors' portfolio. Uh, that fund was launched in 2014. It's open-ended. It has a lot of hedge fund kind of um, look to it in that it is open-ended. It's a 12-month lockup. It's got a redemption uh, thereafter. Um, you know, our, our fees are, are relatively low. We're basically a, a point on a management fee. We actually pay a preferred return to investors and then have a waterfall thereafter. And, uh, and that, that's on an annual basis that we're catching up. So we cover the debt space. Um, in that fund, we manage approximately $175 million at this point in time. And it's uh, similar to just what I alluded to earlier, just in our other fund, in, in which the other fund is a closed end. It's an opportunistic fund. We're looking to buy properties or develop properties, stabilize them, and sell them. We're not long-term holders. Um, uh, you know, there's there's going to be a time for that, but we, we would argue that the market is really top-heavy right now in the real estate world. So we're we're much more active sellers than we are buyers at this point in time. Both strategies uh, we cover. Uh, so we own assets. We're on the equity side and the opportunistic fund. We're on the debt side. So we're kind of seeking shelter in the capital structure in a top-heavy market with our debt fund. But both strategies cater to, you know, our writing checks of $1 to $10 million, which, again, in the private equity world is, is tiny. Uh, our competition a lot of times is not institutional. It's, and we, we joke, we, it's, uh, it's country club money. It's guys going to their country club, passing the hat, and trying to raise $3 million uh, from high net worth folks versus coming to us as a one-stop shop, getting some institutional sophistication that comes with that. We're deliberately, you know, very, a very flat organization. There's nine of us at T2. We're non-bureaucratic. We can move quickly. So it's a big differentiation that's out there. But so writing those smaller checks is a big differentiation. And then our, our core markets are really in the Midwest. Uh, we're, we're actually looking at branching that out, but we're based in Chicago. We're very active in markets like Indianapolis, Minneapolis, Columbus, Ohio, um, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. So we're We've, we've done deals across the, across the country, but over 90% of what we've done is in those Midwestern states. So with that differentiation, it, it, it helps us a lot just to, um, to create a niche, to create a reputation. Uh, we're, we're very cognizant of our perception in the market. So uh, a day in the life of T2 is frankly fielding a lot of inquiries that come our way to say, hey, I've got this deal uh, from a, a sponsor, a, a guy that might be under contract to buy a property or looking to recapitalize a property, somebody coming to us and saying, hey, I've got this situation, but unfortunately I've got three weeks to make this happen. Or, hey, I've got a bankruptcy in my past. My bank won't touch me. Would you guys consider helping me out? And it, and it entails writing a five, seven million dollar check. And so it's just too small for the bigger institutions to play, but it's just right for us, uh, frankly. And it's and, and along those same lines, it's too big uh, for a lot of you know, the high net worth private investor kind of crowd to play in. So that's the, the niche that we serve and, and a, a day in the life is, is fielding a lot of inquiries and, and pursuing a lot of opportunities that just fit that space. Now you mentioned bankruptcy. So mm -hmm. do you guys do any deals in which banks come to you and they say, you know, we've got this situation, et cetera, or you're aware of, and then you, uh, you know, you step in and Basically, you're able to buy it on cents on the dollar, and then and then do the workout that the bank doesn't want to do the workout. So, I, ironically, um, bids are due next Friday. There's a big bank in Chicago called Wintrust. They're publicly traded. Uh, Wintrust came to us just last week and said, "Listen, we've got three troubled loans on our books. Uh, we we think you know the the loan to value, the LTV on each loan is is sub 50 percent, but we've just amended our loan four times for each of these guys. We're just fatigued." Would you guys consider taking us out, and, and we're you know we're open to a bid, and so we're going through that due diligence now. So even in, it's interesting, just because even 
in this current climate where uh, you know there's it's just a massive tailwind in real estate and, and who knows how close to the cliff we are uh, I sure don't um, but even in this market in which it's extremely healthy on the real estate side there's still these obscure opportunities that come our way from banks that are looking to dispose of assets. Okay, and <clears throat> have you encountered anything in the way of uh, good bank, bad bank sort of structures where, um, see in our case, we had a deal that came to us uh, because a country uh, said to the bank, okay, you, <laughs> you guys are gonna take this garbage and put it over here, and then you're gonna take the good stuff over here, and the good stuff will stay alive, and then the bad stuff, get rid of it. Yeah. And then we were able to then buy something very attractively. Yeah, we, we would sure welcome the opportunity. We're, we're yeah. of a size to where, uh, you know, we're not, you know, the, the Starwoods and, and Apollos and KKRs of the world that did the good bank, bad game, public-private partnerships with, with troubled bank loans across the world uh, recently. We're, you know, we're not of that size yet anyway, and so we, as much as we would love to, Right. Well, um, maybe you could like like a, a piece of deal. One of the, by the way, in the one that I just described, Bain took over the the, uh, the bad bank portion for the entire um, uh, loans in Italy. Yeah, they bought out the one. We weren't that big, so yeah. <laughs> we got something a whole lot smaller. But uh, but still, you know, you can find some sweet deals. Definitely. You know, under those not not no risk. Sure. I mean, there, there's elements of risk and dynamic. Your base is right. It worked out reasonably well. Yeah. Joe, I want to I, I want to kind of shift a little bit here to something that I think is kind of underappreciated, and I'm I'm leveraging off of uh, a report that I believe you authored that you sent to me. Hedge solutions transitioning uh, from the passive paradigm, which uh, I would assume you'd make available to everyone here if they'd like to see it. Um, and in this, what what strikes me is that you have items in here that read like a more traditional uh, sort of uh, investment firms, uh, analysis of the macro environment and, you know, sector betting and, you know, to that extent and all that. Um, isn't that something that maybe many investors don't really fully appreciate, that in the methodology of the decision making for private equity investors and you know, the Chris's and Ali's and Jeff's of the world and the decision process they go through, that, it, that there is this kind of bigger picture element that's in there as well? Take us into that. We, yeah, we think so. Um, you know, we talk with uh, a lot of clients, largely uh, RIAs across the country, and it's a challenge for many investors to say or think about where do hedge funds fit within my portfolio. Um, the traditional asset allocation for those investors that do have a sleeve for alternatives, you know, it tends to be in the neighborhood of 50% equities, 40% fixed on income, and 10% alts. Now, that alternative sleeve can be liquid hedge funds, less liquid private credit, or more less liquid uh, or lesser liquid private equity. Um, each of those asset classes or sub-asset classes serve very different purposes in a diversified portfolio. And hedge funds are sort of this amorphous term that solve for a variety of things within a client portfolio. So when we take that sort of 50-40-10 model, we're not thinking necessarily from a traditional and alternative asset class standpoint. We're saying there's a portion of your portfolio that's meant to generate returns, and historically that's long only equities. There's a portion of your portfolio that's meant to preserve capital, and traditionally that's bonds. And then the diversifying portion of your portfolio we think about, and I think Chris alluded to this, that can be longer duration opportunities that provide a distinct and differentiated return source, or within liquid hedge funds, strategies that tend to have a non to negatively correlated profile. So that's how portfolios can and should be diversified. Within hedge funds, there are sub-strategies that are meant to enhance returns, which we think we are in and increasingly entering into an environment where there is a growing opportunity set for distinct return generation across a variety of sub-strategies. Capital preservation, which typically comes from your larger, widely diversified global multi-strategy firms, and then diversifying portfolios, those strategies that I alluded to before. So for clients that are looking to solve for something in their portfolio, and increasingly many clients that we're having these, these two-way conversations with are thinking about it's great that I've been the beneficiary of 18% per annum net returns for my equity exposure for the last seven or eight years. I'm not necessarily convinced that past this prologue, nor am I even convinced that equity returns on a go forward basis will replicate longer term historical averages of say eight to 10%. 
how can I derive sources of return through a variety of sub strategies within hedge funds, broadly defined, that will hit or allow me to hit my return objective. So those are the types of conversations that we're having with clients that yield the best results. We're not necessarily speaking with clients and saying, we like macro, we don't like long short credit, we're neutral on long short equity. We have a view on your standard hedge fund strategies, but more importantly for RIAs and some regional banks and independent broker dealers, it's let's take a more holistic view of your portfolio. Where do you think your returns will come from? We can deconstruct drivers of return in equities. How do you think you'll be protected in an adverse market, which we may be entering into for a variety of macro factors that I think most here read about and, and live each and every day? And are you adequately diversified? So that's sort of, that's our starting point. It's a little different from, let me tell you about Millennium or Canyon or MKP. Let me tell you about macro, multi, and credit. Let's look about your portfolio, and if there are diversifying sources of return and or risk mitigants, perhaps we can collectively solve for something. It, one of the reasons that, that alternative investments have received uh, capital flows over the last number of years is that centered on the inability of um, institutional investors that have required rates of return mandated. I'm thinking pensions, endowments, insurance companies, okay? that they are, they're looking at and they're saying, wow, 10-year treasury, 2.3. And now I'm going into high yield. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm in high yield enough. Now I'm going in emerging market debt, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, boy, if, if, I'm, if I'm looking for a rate of return that's going to give me non-correlated or not, let's say you know, non-correlated, <clears throat> I mean, why am I, you know, is, is that a driver? That, that you see in terms of capital flows coming into this space because they just can't get, you know, without incurring greater risk and greater risk and greater risk, you know, from, you know, traditional investments that they ordinarily would go into publicly traded. Yeah. Yes? I, I think that's absolutely true. So um, I've been investing in hedge funds for about 20 years, and I'd say in the last couple of years, having conversations with clients about hedge fund strategies generally it's been a little bit like shouting into an echo chamber. There's just no feedback from clients. Many investors have taken somewhat of a bifurcated view of, I want my liquid exposure here, mainly through traditional asset classes and through some 40 act structures that are more diverse. And then I want to take my less liquid portion of my portfolio and directly access private equity and private credit. What we've seen more recently in terms of, well, what does drive hedged strategy performance historically and you can take sort of the 2009 and th to, through 2015 period, the real drivers are correlations and dispersion, right? So you need a different outcome and a higher variability of outcome within and across asset classes, and the magnitude of those moves to be wider more than narrow. So what we've seen for the better part of the last seven years, and the environment started to shift, I'd say about 18 months ago, corresponding with changes in interest rates and some pickup in volatility, um, there's more opportunity for hedged strategies to be the return driver. Mm -hmm. And while they have not been the return driver for that 2009 through 2015 period, there are increasing indications that clients can benefit from accessing those return sources that were not in play for a number of years, that if you go back 10, 20, 30 years prior, hedged strategies are meant to capture a portion of the upside and mitigate a meaningful percentage of the downside. It's a very simple construct, but if you're able to do that consistently over time, the diversity aspect of those drivers very much improves mm -hmm. the overall quality of a portfolio. So for our clients that are looking at credit and equity and traditional bonds from a long only standpoint, we think the forward-looking risk and return opportunity set may be skewed to the downside okay. in many of those traditional asset classes. Taking a more hedged approach, and depending upon your liquidity tolerance, if it's from daily to quarterly to more illiquid on the private mm -hmm. credit and private equity side, you know, we think having a suite of products that solve for specific client needs uh, is the best approach. Okay. Now, uh, this is kind of an open-ended question to all of you. Uh, it's a question that I never, I haven't heard asked. So let's, let's kind of, um, one of the other categories that has done very, very well has been exchange traded funds over the last number of years. And one of the things that drives a lot of the money that's going into ETFs uh, 
is completion strategies by institutional investors where I have enough invested in healthcare and yet my, my number should be X. Um, and on the individual issues, this is, I have uh, X minus. So if I'm supposed to have 14% in healthcare, I've got 8% in healthcare, and these are my best ideas, and that's it, okay? And I don't want to double up and double up, and I don't want to go into the other areas, so what do I do? I go into an ETF, and that's my completion strategy. Is that at all anything that happens in the alternative investment space? I mean, th th this may be a question that just goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> it may be something that it just, I'm, I'm curious on anyone, uh, Ali? I mean, I think you see it in where people are trying to manage outcomes to be more like others, but I think that's what you don't want, right? Oh, I mean, in the okay. end of the day, what you're paying for someone to do is to take calculated, thoughtful risks where they're right. And so where you do see that is if people gross up healthcare exposure to benchmark to match a sort of exposure that they feel right. is right or short exposure or long exposure. But my belief is that in the end of the day, you're paying people to take risks. There's no, they're, they're sort of thoughtful about it. They manage that risk, but that's how you get the returns. And if they're, if you're, if you're trying to take that away, then it may not make sense, but, right? But if you guess, don't see good healthcare opportunities, you just don't see good healthcare opportunities. Yeah. Face it and make good decisions and you'll be okay. If you're gonna make, you know, if, if you're wrong in your assessment, then sure, it helps you that you completed by over allocating over But, but let's say that I'm, a, you know, an institutional investor and I have, a, you know, Jeff's great idea and there's something on your platform and, you know, there's some stuff from Chris to you and, okay, and I want to allocate, you know, 8% and I've done it, uh, let's make it, I want to allocate 12% to alternatives and I've done two, 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 and two. Well, that gives me eight. And then everybody else out there, well, I'm, you know, so why don't I then just, you know, g go to some kind of just general area or is this not the way alternative investments would function where I could get my other 4%, I've got now my 12% exposure in alternatives. I'm done. So, so if I, yeah, could, I, I, I don't think there's a like for like corollary, okay. corollary in alternatives. However, I think you're raising a good point. So if you think about hedge funds in a very, very simple form, they're nothing more, at least in my view, than the most pure form of active management that you can buy, okay? However, as you know, the industry has moved further and further out on the on the spectrum of, of sophistication and complexity. There are uh, groups out there, one that comes to mind is Wisdom Tree, but there are others, right, where you have this concept of smart beta. And so if you, if you think about that and you strip out, DFA is another one, right? If you take uh, factors like, like uh, small versus large or high book value minus small, low book value and those types of very simple hedge fund beta type strategies, I think you can buy that in an ETF format and lower the cost of gaining exposure to those other types of factors. However, if you're hiring a truly adept manager, those types of very simple factors shouldn't be a core component of his or her strategy. So in part of your diligence, you should be trying to ferret out what's the real driver of return here. If it's as simple as those basic Fama and French factors or other, call it smart beta factors that have been identified and packaged in a low cost liquid format, you certainly shouldn't pay, you know, one in 20 or two in 20 for that. So that's, that's shame on you. But I don't think there's this uh, completion portfolio uh, corollary okay. that, that you first mentioned. Okay, very good. Uh, just uh, two quick items here, then. Both of these will be directed towards Jeff, and then I want to open up to all of you uh, for questions. Jeff, you were nodding your head before when Joe was uh, responding to my question in regards to uh, and he had mentioned uh, uh, a source of returns and, and looking at the, uh, the kind of uh, unique opportunities that are there that, uh, that institutional investors, I shouldn't say unique opportunities, the unique circumstances, that institutional investors are constrained by the rates of return that they can get you know, elsewhere. You were nodding your head uh, during that period. Is that, that, that sounds like that was like uh, something that you guys encountered. Sure. Um. So in the private equity world, 
where a lot of our funding comes from is um, it's through RAs, gratefully, and, and then on the other end of the spectrum, there's there's these big pension funds and college endowments and and large institutional allocators in the pension world specifically. Uh, they're the ones that jump to mind when you talk about these having these uh, annual return expectations and having you know very meaningful impact toward hitting those returns. So these are retirees whose whose retirement they're they're committed to covering. Uh, being from Illinois, I can tell you it it, it doesn't always work. <laughs> uh, uh, and so we're we're in a bit of a crisis in Illinois uh, because the pension expectations that have been set in at the state level and certainly at the county and city level in Chicago. Uh, have have been far too high relative to the returns that the pension has received going back many many years and corruption aside it, it's been a poor out asset allocation as well and so it's a um, it's a conversation that we have on a regular basis to talk with these pensions and to hear them say hey I've got to return eight percent or eight and a half percent and as much as we want to nod our head and say yep we're we're good for that um, I think a realistic expectation right now is just to proceed with caution. And, and certainly we've hit markets where we've doubled that kind of return, but uh, in the midst of today's real estate market, um, you know, five and six percent might not be all that bad. Uh, uh, going forward in the equities market, I mean, these guys know a heck of a lot better than I do. I mean, just look at where the, the fixed income market is today. You just, I just think it's, there's a lot of uh, wisdom in having realistic expectations by these massive pension funds versus just maintaining a status quo that might have been there for decades now. And, uh, and so again, in Illinois, it's, it's a poster child for what has gone wrong with that model. And then just one quick question, a definitional one, if you would, Jeff. You used the phrase before, waterfall. Yeah. Okay, can you just yeah. describe what Sorry waterfall about that. is? No, no, that's fine. So uh, when I use the, the phrase waterfall, like I used it earlier, it's it's a return of profits and how it's allocated between the investment manager versus the investors. And so uh, in hedge funds, you'll hear the, the phrase two and 20 or something like that, meaning that 20% uh, of the profits are, ma are, are held by the investment manager and 80% are distributed to the investors. Uh, in, in our world, in a lot of real estate and private equity funds, there's what's called a preferred return, meaning that investors, in our case, investors get the first 6% or 8%, depending on which fund they're in on our side. And then there's a waterfall uh, of profit splits thereafter. Um, in our case, investors get the first six or eight percent of profits. Then we, we split profits 80-20, whereby the investment manager keeps 20 percent, and the investors get the next 80. And is that set up like a limited partnership uh, for the most part? Correct. Okay, so it's not like a preferred or anything? That's right. It's set up like a limited okay. partnership. So, yeah, no, no. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, very good. Um, <clears throat> what I try to do is ask questions that I hope are interesting. Uh, for everyone, uh, get a lay of the land, um, and leave a lot of room uh, for questions from all of you. Um, don't touch on everything. Uh, it's not possible to in a brief period of time. Uh, but it allows for the opening up of questions from all of you to explore something that was uh, said, not said, etc. So please, uh, uh, we very much welcome you know, anyone who has any any questions. Yes. Understanding that a, a, the reason a lot of people use alts is for non-correlation. How do you think over a very long period of time, say 20 years, alts after fees do compared to the other traditional uh, asset classes at, you know, ETF uh, type alts? Anyone? I mean, I think, Jim, it's a good question. It's hard to just, because, like I said, alts are nothing more than the most pure form of active management. I think it depends if we're talking about private equity or venture or, you know, multi-strategy, right? In other words, it depends on the risk of the strategy we're taking on, right? If we're taking a, talking about a strategy... Let me clarify this a little bit, because I think in some cases there are alts out there that are almost fixed income-like in Correct. risk and return Precisely. structure, yes. and there are those... So you could do it on a, a similar basis. In other words, you could take the S&P 500 at five dips versus uh, alts that should be uh, compete in an equity class, and then they're alts that are more uh, conservative and more of a fixed income nature. You can apply for it. So I appreciate the clarification, because like you said, you could drive a truck through this. Um, I think 
generally most of the hedge funds out there are garbage and not worth investing in. So if you take the same approach that you would to passive investing, which is, hey, listen, I don't know anything about all of these individual components, so I'm gonna go buy them all, and you did the same thing in, in hedge fund land, I think you'd be very disappointed at your outcome in you know, five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time, whatever you know, long full market cycle period you'd use for measurement. And so I think within hedge fund world, you need to be extremely selective about the managers that, that you allocate to. That said, I think those strategies that are um, lower vol can tend to have higher sharp ratios than higher vol strategies would. However, like for like, pound for pound comparison, I think you are able, or at least I believe at Finemark, we are able to identify managers that, again, on a risk adjusted basis would outstrip passive equity or fixed income investing long term. So I do think if the goal is to, hey, invest, you know, 100 bucks today and at time, you know, 10 years time or 15 years time, have more money net net and do so at a, at a more, in a more efficient portfolio, in other words, a more statistically robust portfolio, I think the inclusion of alternatives net of all fees and expenses is, is a worthwhile endeavor but not on a not on a blind basis. That's that's the big difference I think between that and and inequities. Um, I, I think Ali it's important to consider a portfolio context too, right? I mean, there's very few cases where you would say that you're going all alts or not. And I think that if you package them right and they're right for your client, then they work, right? So there's there's different ones, different return profiles based on the risk. But I but I also think that you know, that in the portfolio context, they can have a much bigger impact. You know, if you have the same return profile as the S&P and you have it with no correlation, then you're adding a lot of value. Uh, so I think that that's something to consider. And, right. and Joe, isn't that what, what you guys do? Yeah, managed futures are probably the best example. They are amongst classic hedge fund strategies. They are the uh, most different relative to hedged equity credit and event. And unfortunately, for many investors uh, that do invest in CTAs or managed futures, they will tend to pile in post-2008 after a great year, and then 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, where it's not a very good five-year period for managed futures. And then many investors will redeem. And then in 2014, particularly in the fourth quarter of 2014, Gosh. when commodity prices fell by half, many CTA managers in a three-month period were up 20 to 30%. So there's the portfolio utility component. Now CTAs on a standalone basis have horrendous looking sharp ratios. And I wouldn't say that's by design, but it's not unexpected. But they have positive convexity, they have positive utility in a portfolio where I wouldn't expect even given how much that sub strategy has struggled basically since the end of 2014 to outperform necessarily on a go forward basis. But for those clients that want to have diversity through hedged strategies in their portfolio, arguably now is a very good time to have it. Because if you're looking at the front window and not the rear view mirror, we think you know, managed futures, by way of example, are, are very interesting. In terms of just different strategies, quickly, um, one of the funds that we offer, and I, I agree with Chris, there is, there's massive interquartile spread in alternatives, hedge funds, and more so in private equity. Um, one of the funds that we offer uh, that is an organization that's been around since 1990, the fund has been around since 2004, so it's coming up on its 14-year anniversary. Over that 14-year period, which had a bull market, a collapse, and a subsequent bull market, that fund, just by way of example to frame the, the picture somewhat, that fund has captured 65% of the upside and 40% of the downside, using 14 years of monthly S&P data. And that doesn't sound that impressive, at least to me, it doesn't sound all that impressive. But if you look at that profile over a long period of time, in this case, 14 years, that fund has generated S&P 500 plus 300 basis points with two thirds the volatility and half the drawdown. So taking a longer term perspective, that top quartile universe of managers, that's not to say that that manager will be the top quartile over the next 14 years, but there is the benefit of having that spread with different strategies participating in different ways long term. Thank you. Um, question, yes. 
Any sense or um, any comments about where you think we are in the business cycle and how that um, influences your outlook, um, or more specifically, how that is influencing your investment style today? Any thoughts on that? Uh, we're um, we're not uh, overly optimistic on long only equities or long long only fixed income. I, I don't think that's a controversial view. I think the challenge for investors is if they do share that view at a high level. Okay, now what? Well, how do I solve for? Back to Vinny's question earlier. Well, what then do I do in terms of accessing different drivers of performance within my diversified portfolio? There was a, a, a research report that came out a few months ago. Um, that very, very nicely deconstructed the drivers of return in equities. And if you think dividends, earnings growth, multiple and margin expansion, where we are over the past eight or nine years and what historical normalities would be and then what expectations for future returns are from a reasonable perspective, in our view, it's hard to be too optimistic on long-only equities as being the core driver of performance over the next five to seven years. And obviously, with fixed income, where you have, you know, the, the Fed maybe not backstopping, uh, you know, with a balance sheet that's gone up from rough numbers seven hundred billion to four and a half trillion dollars, that seems to be very slowly reversing course in interest rates. We've had four hikes since two thousand and fifteen. Expected to have one more. Expected to have two or three in twenty eighteen. I just think it's it's a challenge for investors that are overweight equities and fixed income. And we think the need for alternatives for RIAs and their, their clients is only increasing given the elevation of some of the traditional assets that we look at. Yeah. Stephen, our, our view at Finemark is, um, at least in the U.S., if you, if you think about from the global financial crisis till today, the U.S. Um, reacted a lot more definitively and swiftly uh, during the crisis than, say, the rest of the developed world, Europe, the U.K., and uh, Japan. But if you think about the healing process, I think we're, again, much further along. And you're starting to see that even in central bank policy, right? You saw the end of QE in 14, and then we are in a tightening mode, although it's been at a glacial pace, right? One hike in 15, one in 16, two this year, likely one in, in December. Uh, if you listen to um, uh, Governor uh, Carney's testimony uh, out of the Bank of England, it seems that they are moving toward a hike finally there. Um, and in Europe, it, it seems like QE may be finally coming to an end. And so we've been gradually rotating uh, what had been a massive overweight in U.S. equities versus international um, in March. We took our first step in March. We took another step in June. Um, we're considering doing more. Um, so that's been a rotation we've been taking. So I, I, I would agree with, with Joe. You know, I don't think equities are cheap anywhere. Um, if you look at the factors that go into at least our decisions for allocating to equities, um, you look at valuation, which is a very poor metric near term. It's, um, they're sort of at historical averages in most of the developed world. They're above average here in the U.S. They're below average in Japan. Uh, but if you look at the rest of the factors, you know, earnings growth, momentum, and macro, um, it's generally in pretty good shape. So. It's getting more difficult to own equities, I agree, um, but a lot of the factors for owning them are still in place. So you should be, I think, concerned, more concerned than you were, but probably still quite long. Okay. Uh, I would say I'm more conservatively oriented than probably everyone I see. Uh, I think that there's really two things that come into owning equities. One of them is that you try to make a return on that investment by generating cash flows. Uh, that's the valuation metric side of it. I think that if you look really kind of throughout history, there's been maybe two years that have had a more highly valued market, and that being sort of the 99 time frame. So if you look at market cap to GDP, if you look at CAPE averages, even if you strip out 08, really the stocks are about as expensive as they've been. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of people that just, like you said, these things matter over, over more over long term than short term. Um, over short term, you know, it's a little bit of animal spirits and people's ownership. Household ownership of equities at this point in this country is, is uh, only been exceeded again by 99 as a percent of net worth. 
But then I think the issue that you have is lots of people just go buy stocks, right? I'm going to buy stocks. They don't know what they're buying, but they're buying stocks. Um, I think the problem is, and so that, that drives the market because there's a supply and demand balance that goes on. If you think of savings rates in this country and you look at GDP, 18 trillion, let's say a 4 or 5% savings rate, that's about $700 billion in assets that get allocated to new investments every single year. So now you go through, you go through these QE processes and you just doubled that. So they bought 700, 700, 700 more at least in this country. So 13 coming till now, you didn't have any earnings growth. I know we do have earnings growth now, but shockingly, 16 is the same earnings level as 13. I don't think many people would realize that if, if just from the way the market's acted. And now you've got this setup where all of a sudden, all right, well, we're going to reverse course because next time we have a crisis, we can't sell stock. We can't drop rates, right? So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to reinitiate a QE. So we have to unwind the QE. So in my opinion, you've kind of taken the whole investment argument out a little bit. And then on top of that, the animal spirits are going to get whacked because if there's the Fed, I see it as the Fed call now, right? Where before there was a Fed put, the Fed had your back, the Fed is against you now. A totally 100% against you going into next year. Any bid is going to get whacked. Any time, if, if, if someone wants to buy stocks, if someone wants to buy bonds, whatever happens, they want to get it off that balance sheet as fast as possible. And the size of what they're getting off is so dramatic that if you look at three, four years, I don't see, re I, I see returns from a timing wise, going into, I think as soon as you get this tax cut, this is what everyone's waiting for, that's the only good thing, it's a sell the news event, and from then on, you've got three or four years that are just going to be really disappointing to people. And I think the most important thing you can do, and it goes back to what one of these other gentlemen said, is have realistic expectations. Because what ends up happening in these periods when you get aggressive, when it's the wrong time to get aggressive, you really hurt yourself. If you manage expectations, if you kind of hunker down a little bit, then these are great periods. This is when you do your best. You know, we had our best run from 08 to 10. Uh, but you can't do that unless you're conservative walking in, right? It's really hard to buy stocks and make investments when everything is going against you, especially if, if you haven't taken the time to prepare. So in my opinion, I would say walking into this tax cut, which I do think probably happens, this is setting up as a tough year, but that's a good thing, right? Thoughtful people, in the end of the year, day, the market's going to do whatever it's going to do. If you take share, right, if you make better decisions than everyone else, then you end up doing better over time, right? This is the time to think about that this next couple years. This is when I would say you take a very conservative stance. And I do think it'll keep running into this tax cut because, you know, but, but even that is misplaced. Like I looked at taxes paid on the S&P, so everyone's been buying small cap index, right? So you go look at the actual cash taxes paid on the small cap index, and it's less than 1% less than of the market cap of the index, 0.7, 0.8%. How is that going to help? So take that down by 20%. So that's you know a quarter of a percent, even if you put a big multiple on that. The day that people talked about taxes, the S&P small cap ran up past that. So it's kind of this little animal spirits going into this, this event, this event, and then when it's done, all you're going to have is the worst companies having a higher component of earnings in this country than before. Now all of a sudden the big banks that really aren't adding that much, you know, retailers that are domestic, all the companies that couldn't expand weren't thoughtful enough to go lower their tax rates and manage their business now become a higher component of S&P earnings and the cow is gone. So I would be very very cautious, but with an optimistic eye, right? This is where you make a lot of money. This is where it gets fun if you're thoughtful. Sure. Uh, how many of you have heard the, uh, uh, the word FOMO? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. I think you'll hear more of that as if the market continues along, along yeah, it's fear of missing out. It, you've heard it, in, it used in many other ways. But that's, you know, that, that, I, I love that because it really condenses it down to fear of missing out. And, you know, and so much of it, as you guys know, as I think everybody here knows, is that, you know, it's, it's justification for actions that you take. And if you can justify it, I mean, look, do investment managers lose clients in up markets or down markets? They lose them in up markets. They don't lose clients in down markets. So... What do you do? There's a bias that's there. 
to be on the bullish side as, as often as you can be because I'm not going to lose a client. As long as I'm doing as well as Ali, as long as I'm doing as well as Joe, you know, that's okay. Then I keep my clients, he keeps his clients, he keeps his clients, and there's the game. And the game plays and it goes round and round. And then the element that gets added to this is the whole FOMO thing and, and all of that. And it'll be really fascinating to see how it all works out. And then just one of the dynamic to add to this is that the Bank of Japan, I did not know this, I don't know how many people know, that the Bank of Japan, its QE is buying equities. Yes, that's true. <laughs> this and QE. Switzerland, this is the biggest, one of the biggest shareholders of Apple. These guys are, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Um, Questions, yes. Uh, question for Jeff. Uh, I just have my own personal curiosity and as a Midwesterner myself. Um, have you looked around uh, Detroit at all? I've read a lot about you know, the revitalization going on in the downtown area and the around some of the sports facilities down there. Um, is, it, is it something that is not on your radar? It has. Uh, we've actually done some deals in Detroit. It's a uh, it's a phenomenal renaissance story, I will, I'll say that. And I, I attribute a lot of it to, so Detroit was, back to this poster child kind of theme, they were the poster child of uh, just decimation in the downturn. And what happened in Detroit, and it's, you know, you can all read about it, but a lot of huge private money came into town. Dan Gilbert, who owns the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans, bought up so much real estate, uh, so many vacant, uh, desolate office buildings and filled them with Quicken Loans employees and he did that repeatedly over and over again. Mike Illich who owns Little Caesars Pizza and the Detroit Red Wings did something very similar. Um, and so it, it, it's just been a great story. Downtown Detroit is actually really pricey now. I have two cousins that live in downtown Detroit. That would have never been a topic of conversation even 10 years ago. Uh, but now you know, they're working really hard on mass transit. Um, uh, they've beefed up their security. They went through, they, they kind of had their cleansing with the bankruptcy. Um, it, it, frankly, it's something that in Chicago we talk a lot about is look what Detroit had to do to get to where they are today. Um, so uh, D Detroit's a phenomenal story. We're, we're looking there and it, it's funny to say uh, it's difficult to find compelling buy-in opportunities because pricing is elevated. What do you see like, as far as cap rates in Detroit? The, they're certainly not Miami-esque or New York-esque or anything, but they're, they're comparable to um, I'd say a second tier market anyway, a market like Indianapolis. Pittsburgh, uh, perhaps? I'm Pittsburgh, sorry? Like Pittsburgh, perhaps? Like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's another very solid market. Um, but five ish, five and a half type percents, which is, again, uh, six, seven years ago, it had been cr exactly right. Exactly right. So just a great, great story of the city of Detroit going through its cleansing and inviting huge private investment and allowing those guys to do what they've done. And it's turned the city around. And by the way, one thing uh, in, in terms of we know about in New York, everyone's heard in New York about the market, the real estate market overall, and the high end of the market, which you don't hear talked a lot about, are areas like Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Bushwick, where the city of New York was giving away for $10,000 this brownstone on Bushwick Avenue in Bushwick, okay? That is now going for a million dollars a floor. That's the value. So in a brief period of time, 10,000, so who knows, maybe Detroit turns into something, you know, along the lines of that story. It really is quite remarkable. Great, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, anyone else? Yes. I wanted to open this up to the panel. <clears throat> but just in regards to performance reporting with internal rate of return, um, are you seeing the CFA or maybe the industry itself self-regulating in terms of funds that do distribute capital you know, the given uh, calculation is assuming it's reinvested at the internal rate of return. But if it's actually not, if the client's not reinvesting it, they're taking the distributions, I believe a modified internal rate of return is the way to correct for that overperformance that's reported. Do you see the industry moving in that direction? Yes. Anyone have thoughts on that? No. 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 Stump the panel. <laughs> <laughs> You win the prize. You win the prize for stunt the so real, real yeah, quick, on, a, on the IRR comment, real quick, just um, one of the things we've taken the step of, because IRR can be misconstrued, is we've gone so far in our limited partnership agreement to define how IRR is calculated. And so it is uh, you know, given to all our investors for their own read and approval and whatnot. But it, to your point, it, 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 
it's a, it's a straightforward Microsoft Excel calculation, but um, many inputs have led to confusion. Um, so a very fair point. Did you have something to add to? No, I just have a question. Okay, please. Um, so short ball funds, right? Short ball strategies, all that stuff. I'm reading a little bit about maybe long ball strategies starting to come out and given your point, like it would probably be an interesting time given the convexity and if you can find a way of, of managing the time decay a little bit because that's why, you know, anything on your guys' end looking at it, are people trying to raise money for it already? Is it happening? Nothing. Um, at a higher level, I would say it's an interesting strategy. It's, it's tough because, um, you, you know, there's the... That, that decomposition of alpha and beta. And then if you're looking at sort of what is essentially a, a factor bet from just looking at volatility, um, what's the right pricing mechanism? What's the right structure? What's the right liquidity profile? Um, you know, there's not a lot of guys who've made a lot of money being long volatility for now quite a while. Um, so it's, I think, a challenging environment to sort of set up shop as a long vol option that said, a growing number of investors that we speak with pretty regularly are looking for broader strategies that have components of being tied to pickups in, in volatility. And again, that tends to be on that diversifying end of the spectrum, global macro, systematic trading, commodity trading advisors, managed futures, and the like, more than simply long volatility or even volatility arbitrage strategies. Over time, I think it'll be an interesting area. But for those investors that are anticipating an uptick in volatility in equities, bonds, currencies, or commodities, it's probably more popular to access that via a multi-strategy vehicle than a dedicated long vol fund. I'd say to your comment, be really cautious about any short vol hedge fund that you come across. I mean, if you think about hedge fund failures and you do any sort of study on them, and it sounds like you're doing a fair bit of study, so if you look into hedge funds that have failed over the years, or is LTCM or what have you, other than fraud, right? Because Phil kicked off this meeting talking a little bit about Madoff and fraud. So, so put fraud aside. In other words, if someone's trying to steal your money, it doesn't really matter what the strategy is, they're crooks. So, um, but if you combine low vol and then any degree of, of illiquidity, uh, in, in my view, that those two elements in finance are, are the disaster waiting to happen. That, that is just how you get into a, a world of trouble. And so I'd be very cautious of any short vol fund long term, and unless you have an ability to time it, I'd, I'd, stay, I'd stay well away from that. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, Phil? Yeah, I wanted to hear a little more from Ali about uh, his strategy. As I recall, you do large cap US and your long short but if you could put to a little more detail on that and what led to your success in being manager of the year and, and have you been persistent in your strategy? Sure. So our strategy is an all cap U.S. long short and it's a variable approach. It's something that I think is, you know, that I, I'm a big fan of and, and one of the reasons is, is that generally it doesn't pay to always be short the market and I feel like we touch the stocks and we're as close to it as anyone can be and so when the opportunities present themselves we want to be able to shift our orientation and take advantage of it. So you know we like I said we had a great run we walked into a 08 you know relatively hedged and we were buying stocks truly trading at net cash. Right. So, uh, you know, when you when we were coming out of that, we were able to take the portfolio and totally reorient it. I think the variable exposure is really nice because it's not all about indexes going down. Right. I think if you look at ETFs and the way they're constructed, they're all on market cap. The funny thing is, if market goes down 30 percent or 50 percent and their stocks with 50 percent of their cap in cash versus ones that are highly levered, all of a sudden the dispersion and kind of what presents itself as opportunities is huge. And that's why, I, that's why I say if you kind of do your homework and plan for these things, they really set themselves up very nicely. So, you know, we had a great run at this point in the cycle. I kind of feel like it's a, a redux, a little bit coming back, back again. I don't necessarily see, except for the short vol, which could absolutely be a disaster, because they're really, with the growth of ETFs, there are no underlying buyers for a lot of these stocks. And if you have ETFs go dump some of these small cap stocks, 
It could be just horrific, the outcome that happens, especially along, along the small cap spectrum. But I think you're setting up for this event where you, know, you could have a great opportunity to make nice long-term investments again. Um, and so we're doing the same thing, you know, always make improvements, get a little tighter, get a little smarter and better. Um, and, uh, and in the way we're set up now, we're independent and, you know, are able to be more nimble, which makes it nice. So. A follow on, I think uh, earlier in the reception, you mentioned that you had two analysts on your team and they were CFA charter holders, as we discussed the significance of the CFA. Uh, how large is your team and what are the characteristics of the people that you have working with? Yes, so I have uh, two analysts and one of them, both CFAs. One of them went to University of Indiana Business School, one went to Duke Business School. Uh, I have a partner in Balter Capital Management that put up a seed for us. They've distributed 40 Act funds before. 40 Act is very, very compliance intensive. I did not want that to be the bog down of my company. I wanted to go to someone that's got a proven record with that. So they put us up, they house us, they, we run, you know, it's our firm, my firm, but literally we sit on the floor with them and they handle everything and help us with it so that we can be really tight operationally and keep that kind of independence. So my team, my investment team, and then the Balter guys have, you know, 10 people that mostly focus on operations and a few more salespeople. So uh, it's a nice setup, you know, we're really, really excited. And we just launched, so I just left Boston Partners about a year and a half ago, and we've, we've launched this now uh, a couple months, so. And I feel like the environment, like I said, the environment is just setting up. This is what, you know, they're, they're, if you look at the way the small cap market is, it's awful. It's just disgusting what you see, and you see people chasing these ETFs. ETFs and small cap are ugly. Please do not go buy small cap ETF. Vanguard S&P is fantastic, right? Great way to allocate money if you want to. The small cap ETFs, if you're in the Russell, 3, Russell 2, uh, 2000 and you're in the S&P 600, 36% of your share is outstanding or traded in those two. right? So you combine 36% in those two indexes. You combine management owns 20%. Right, so you're left with 45% left. There's like four institutions in these names. And so if you get a drawdown or you get a vol situation like you're talking about, there isn't a buyer. There's just no one sitting there. There's no one looking at it. There's no one actually cares about that name, right? So the, the damage that can happen, and this is, like, again, this is what we're looking at right now, right? So we're much more long, long large caps. And then we have a massive short book of small caps that, that don't earn any money. If you look at the Russell, it doesn't earn any money. Uh, the PE is 100 plus, which sounds crazy, but it is. That in aggregate, the Russell 2000 doesn't make a lot of money. Um, so uh, I, I, we're set up well. We're really excited. We got great operational backing, and I think uh, I think this market's going to set up. But like I said, the small caps I would be very very wary of. If even if you think of financing costs of what's going on. Right, if I see a small cap issuer go to the bond market to borrow money, they're paying 300 basis points more than the big guy, right? So, and then you look at the multiple of the small cap indexes, they're at 30 times, even on a stated earnings, they're over 30 times versus the S&P at 20 something. You know, that, it's, it's a little out of whack. So, um, I hope I answered your question. You're still doing all of this from an exotic location like Boston? Exotic location like downtown Boston, absolutely. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Thank you. Let's go to uh, closing comment. Um, a thought, an idea, something we covered, something we didn't cover. Uh, thought to leave everybody with, and uh, since you've done this before, Chris, <laughs> I'll go to you first. Thanks, Kenny. Um, I would say if you are unfamiliar with hedge funds, be very careful when you make allocations. In fact, I would urge you to not make allocations. Um, without some real advice and counsel and some education. Um, I think, the, like I said, we were talking a little bit about the dispersion of, of returns within the asset class, and that, to use the, the, the technical term that, that Joe used, that interquartile range is incredibly wide, and it's much wider than it is in traditional asset classes, you know, in stocks and bonds. And so if this is new to you, I think you need to be very, very cautious with it. That said, you know, we've gone through an incredibly long period of time where, you know, essentially you could have bought 
you know, any sort of large, large cap domestic ETF and gone to the beach uh, starting in, in 2009. And it, you know, we're getting to the point where it's, it's almost absurd, not, not from a valuation standpoint, but from, I believe, the level of complacency. This last quarter, we saw intraday vol drop to levels that we haven't seen since 1968. It's, it's truly uh, a really um, low level of, or excuse me, a high level of investor complacency. I think people's memories are, are very short. You're starting to see, finally, um, a rotation of retail flows into equities um, which is generally a bad sign because retail investors uh, generally shoot themselves in the foot and both knees. And so they're a good contraindicator to look at. Um, so that's sort of the stuff that we're looking at. It's been a very difficult time to be an allocator to hedge funds over the last few years, of course, because you've looked uh, very foolish. But I think, you know, if you think about allocating capital over long periods of time and where you are going to end up and trying to be a good steward of your client's wealth, I think you'd be um, in good stead to, to consider alternatives and thinking about interweaving them into um, an allocation to think about how you could build a better portfolio allocation. But, but to do it blindly, I think, is, is very, very dangerous. Thank you. Uh, Ali, your closing comment. Yeah, I would say spend as much time working on what you're doing now as you would on working on a plan for different scenarios that may evolve. Right, because the where you make a lot of money is if you can act and act thoughtfully and fast when opportunities present themselves. And so I would do that. And then the second thing I would say for the people that are RIAs, just be really understanding of what your clients' needs and wants are. I think one of the worst things that can happen is that loss of performance that happens because of miscommunication, because clients allocate at the wrong time, get uncomfortable at the wrong time. Right? So if you have these discussions in advance, if, you kinda, if your clients understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're going about it, if you have a playbook lined up for different scenarios that can evolve, you can end up a winner from any scenario. Um, so that's basically how I would approach it. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, your closing comment, please. Sir. In the real estate space, I'd say it's a, it's a consistent theme. Um, there's lots of talk in real estate of what inning are we in, and and uh, you know really smart guys like Sam Zell have gone on saying we're we're in the 12th inning at this point. We're 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 deep into the night, and uh, so just a similar theme of just proceed with caution. And you know in, in our world, you know three four years ago we used to buy spec buildings or build spec buildings or buy vacant buildings, and and uh, you know believe that the market was moving in our favor and we were handsomely rewarded with you know two and three times multiples on our investment. Nowadays we're you know, everything is priced to perfection. Even that proverbial spec vacant building or, uh, or whatever is, is priced as if it's already leased. And so we're just ultra conservative. Uh, we don't participate in auctions or beauty pageants. Uh, it's, uh, again, there's just a lot of money chasing, chasing deals right now. So uh, we're doing a fair amount of build a suits in which we have a tenant in our pocket before we stick a shovel in the ground or, or we're buying something that's a, a desperate seller is in need of selling for whatever reason. So it just, Again, just a similar theme. I would just urge caution and, and uh, be ultra selective with, with who you're allocating money to. Terrific. In the 12th inning. Yep. Something to remember. Yep. Okay, and Joe, yeah. last comment. A lot of investors, um, all investors really, haven't really needed to understand, well, what has driven the returns in my portfolio? What portions of my portfolio have protected capital because we've been on a one-way train for many, many years? Um, that's not to say go from traditional to alternative or long only to hedge. But we do think we're in an environment where understanding those drivers of return and those protectors within a portfolio, be they equities, bonds, alternatives, hedge fund, private equity, or credit, will be more and more important. Transparency has, was a buzzword for a lot of years. Uh, I don't hear it as much these past couple of years, partly due to the phenomena of the markets in which we've been in. And I would only emphasize the fact that understanding those return drivers, understanding your risk factors, and paying a premium for transparency in terms of gaining that understanding is likely to be far more important over the next five to ten years than what it's been over the past five to ten years. Thank you. And my closing comment is uh, the usual one that I do every time at the end, uh, and that is, uh, number one, I find this incredibly fascinating not only because I'm involved with it, but also because it is every time I've done this for the past 14 years, I learned something. And you guys have been great. 
you know, covered a lot of areas that I think uh, is helpful to people who understand that, you know, alternative investments is not something that's sort of like out there. You know, you hear from these guys and you go, wow, oh, they really know what they're talking about. And this is a space, frankly, that I think is that's probably the best ad for being in this investment category uh, uh, that they could possibly have. And this has been consistent with every one of these events that we've had over the years. We've had excellent people talking about stuff on a much more sophisticated level than I think many really uh, investors fully appreciate. So uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming here this evening. Thank you, Phil, as always, uh, for making this happen, and uh, to your board, et cetera. Um, and before I ask you to join me in thanking our panel, okay, I forgot to mention before, if you have a remote interest in anything that my company is doing, I'm plugging this. This is an ad, okay? The material's right here in the front. Take it. Simply shoot me an email if you'd like to learn more about it. And also for Joe's report, if you'd like it, just give me a card. I have the, the PDF. I'll send it to you. Uh, that also not only is good information, but also helps to round out the knowledge of understanding what is happening in, uh, in overall the entire alternative investment space. Uh, and last point, I ask you to please join me in thanking our panel for an excellent discussion. Thank you. Okay. Um,